1969 Santa Barbara oil spill. Fundamentally important event in the history of our country, fundamentally important, certainly fundamentally important thing in the foundation of the modern environmental movement, modern environmental policy, all that kind of stuff. Now we are here in California, so when we say, hey, what, what, what's one of the things that sparked the, the environmental movement? We always say, especially in Southern California, we'll say, you know, 1969 Santa Barbara oil spill. There were other things happening as well. And if we were in the Midwest, for example, we might say the Cuyahoga River, uh, you know, in the Midwest uh, river going through farmlands and, and that kind of thing, uh, caught fire for the fifth time. And people were saying like, you know, the water shouldn't be burning and there shouldn't be oil instead of water washing up on beaches. And so the reality is there are many things, there are many things. But the Santa Barbara oil spill was certainly very, very important. And I would argue, um, certainly uh, one of the most important, if not the, the most important, one of the most important things. So let's talk a little bit about that oil spill before we get um, into other oil spills and things of that nature as, as something of a um, case study. Case study. Okay. Um, so why don't you guys tell me before we get going, tell me what you know about, like in a couple sentences, what, what was the story of the Santa Barbara oil spill that you remember or that you know of? Anything? Interesting, you're so young. Okay, so then you're a blank slate. So I can tell you all about this thing. Okay, um, so before we start talking about uh, the Santa Barbara oil spill, let's talk about um, the lay of the land uh, before 1969. This is Summerland in Santa Barbara County in 19, about 1905 on a postcard. So that's already by, you know, 1900, you have this going on. Now, um, the, uh, you know, we, we, we do the commercial oil drilling for the first time in this country back east in Pennsylvania, but very, very quickly, within a few months, throw that, uh, throw that, that pump on a train, take it over here, and it gets shipped out to basically Ojai, Ojai area and Santa Paula area and that area, and we start um, drilling. And so very quickly, California, particularly our part of California, becomes one of the epicenters of this new technology, which is petroleum, liquid petroleum, and starting to use that to fuel our economy, to supplant coal and wood and things of that nature in a very, very large way. So we very quickly start on land, and then we realize, oh my God, we really wish we could go out to the ocean. And so that's what these guys are doing. This is primitive. This is, this is um, I think this is the first of people drilling in marine, you know, technically in, in the ocean. Now it's not very deep, it's just off the beach, but they've built these essentially piers so they can have straws farther and farther out into the water. They can basically jam these straws into the geological formation and suck out oil. Uh, this is the Mesa in, in Santa Barbara. Um, a, couple, a couple decades later, again, covered with oil derricks. Why was our area so popular? It was popular because we had these naturally occurring before humans did anything because of our geological formations. We have oil that's very close to the surface and, and is fractured so that it can go from these deep, these uh, underground reservoirs up and come into the air or into the water. And so again, 1890, before we even start actively drilling, um, this is a um, asphalt mine, basically where UCSB is now. And so these guys are all commercially digging the ground, digging up essentially um, if you can imagine a really, really, really hot day in the hottest, hottest, hot, hot, hot day of the summer, and, and you know that black top gets kind of blacky and melty and tar, it's like that kind of stuff, right? So, so the type of oil that we have in our formations are very uh, overrepresented in things called asphaltines. So the, the, the crudest, the thickest, the heaviest part of the fraction of oil and gas, and that's what we have. So we have very thick, goopy tar. 
This is also um, one of the reasons clearly why the Shumash people settled here. Um, again, the old story, which is incorrect now, we, we believe. Um, the old story, when I was young, it was, oh my gosh, these people came over from Asia. They got very, very cold. They came over the so-called land bridge from Beringia, and they, they came over into Alaska, and they were chasing big game, and they came down to North America. We do not believe that's what happened now. What we believe now is they followed what we know is what we now are calling the Kelp Highway. So people definitely came over. So North America was definitely peopled by folks from Asia, especially at least our West Coast, especially. But they very quickly shot past Alaska and they weren't into grunge and they went way past all that stuff and they came way down to us very quickly, probably chasing sea otters in kelp beds. And they got down here and they're like, oh my God, what is this? So this is the first place we had these very large oil seeps, Santa Barbara, Ventura County. And so the, the main technology that evolves there are the tomos, the traditional canoes that the Shumash people use. And those are different from just about all the canoes just about everywhere else in the world. So everywhere else in the world, we have a tree, chop the tree, like in Louisiana, chop the tree, choo, 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 boom, tree falls down. Dig out the inside or burn out the inside, chop, 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 dig, 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 dig. And then we have a hollowed out log and that's our, our canoe, let's say. Or if we're folks up in Alaska or whatever, we're gonna kill some walruses and then take some wood and bone and create a, create a, um, a frame and then stretch an animal skin uh, over that, you know, watertight animal skin over that frame. Those are the main ways we made boats. Here, they actually made boats from floating wood, chopped up the wood into planks, how we might do it today. And they took plank one and put it next to plank two and put it next to plank three. And so they could make these you know, cool vessels. If they just did that and they got out in the water, the water would leak in through the, the cracks between the, the, um, the wood planks. So they took all of this asphalting, this asphalt, this tar, and they jammed it all up in the cracks. And they made their vessels waterproof because of the readily available tar. So we humans have been using this oil resource for thousands of years here, no question. This is, this is, we have a long-term relationship. So for at least, at least you know, 13, 14,000 years, we've been using this technology here in Ventura and in Santa Barbara. Another shot of that same era, turn of the century, you know, very large industrial scale. In this case, these guys are just digging it out grossly, right? They're not, they're not putting a straw on the ground, they're digging out the rocks and they're gonna melt that rock and use it for uh, you know, covering things. Okay. Oil spills are a part of our society. As long as we're gonna be dealing with a fossil fuel economy, we're gonna be dealing with this. So two years ago, um, almost to the day, this is what happened. And we now know these were Ukrainian operatives that blew up Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2. This was, these are gas pipelines bringing gas, natural gas from Russia into Germany and, 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 and Europe. Two, two separate um, runs, each one had an A and a B. So there were a total of four different pipelines bringing gas um, from Russia into Europe. Originally, that was, that was thought as a, a, a global security thing. It would make Russia less likely to attack Europe, right? Because Europe's paying their bills, right? That obviously didn't work. And then Russia invaded Ukraine. And we didn't know for a long time until this summer, but this summer has been revealed that there were these uh, Ukrainian operators, unclear if they were sanctioned by Zelensky's government, but regardless, they were Ukrainian folks and they blew up these pipelines, right? And so they created a gas, a gas spill. And that's what we're looking at here. We're looking um, a shot down at essentially petroleum bubbling up from the bottom of the ocean coming up to the surface. And then that led to very quickly shutting down both, you know, uh, you know so, so all the lines were shut down at that point and have yet to resume. And, and at this point probably never will. Uh, and that, that's, that's an example of uh, the plume from this, uh, this explosion um, emitting methane, a very potent greenhouse gas, um, until, it was, until they were turned off. And that's, that's the path they go from Russia down into Germany, Nord Stream 1 and Nord Stream 2. Okay, so uh, 
switching back to the story of our oil and gas, uh, underwater oil and gas stories here. Um, so this is California. We have offshore oil platforms. It started going in. So I showed that picture of, of the people doing the little piers in Summerland. We started getting much more sophisticated by the 1960s. So from the 1960s to the 1980s, we started adding in a lot of offshore oil and gas uh, uh, production to get access to these oil and gas reservoirs that aren't on land, that are farther offshore. When these things first went in, the technology was, you know, 50 years old or 50 years ago, right? It wasn't as sophisticated as it is now. So we basically had to take essentially a tube and go like this mm, and jam it in the ground. So if there was a reservoir five miles over there, we'd have to drive five miles over there and uh, jam a straw in. Now, just so you know, now we've gotten very, very sophisticated. Now I can drill from here and have my drill go all the way, the drill bit go all the way over five miles over there. And in fact, now we can do a lot of this stuff from land. We don't even have to go out into the ocean. Um, but suffice to say, back in the day, we didn't have that technology. So we wanted to get those at those reserves, those bubbles of oil underneath the rock. So we had to go out there. So um, these, this is the current uh, situation uh, in terms of where we are. All of these oil and gas platforms in California are off Southern California. They're off Santa Barbara, Ventura, Los Angeles counties. That's it. That's it. So it's really, a, a, it's an R region phenomenon. I'll just say that these are insane Technology. These are crazy. So much so, never ever in the history of our planet will we ever build these again. They're just too expensive. And we do the things completely different now. So now the North Sea in Europe, which is the leader of this technology now, do it a completely different way. They essentially cable stuff in. They don't build a giant superstructure because there the water is even deeper than it is here. And it just isn't crazy. So this is the equivalent of building the Empire State Building underwater, right? This is very, very deep. And the way we built these in this era was to make them uh, honking, uh, big girders, huge, strong, you know, big, big chunks of steel in the, in the ocean. And as you probably know, putting metal in salt water, that doesn't do really well. So you have to take all kinds of precautions to make sure they're managed, designed, maintained, et cetera. So we have a series, each of these dots here on the upper right are, uh, is a location of an offshore oil well. Um, some of these are in federal waters, which is beyond, uh, you know, the three miles, and some are in state waters. Um, so here is, uh, here's our neck of the woods. So this is excluding the, the handful off of uh, Long Beach. But, but the, this, is, this is our neck of the world, world. And what you're seeing here is you're seeing the current uh, situation, the the grid, the square is a lease. So an entity, a company has, has, has bid on the oil and gas underneath that grid. And, and so that, that's essentially a holding. And then you can see these little icons for these little uh, uh, guys here, which are the platforms. And then the lines, you see the colored lines, those are pipelines bringing the material from that particular platform to the mainland. Most of our platforms all of our platforms up here are, are, um, are production platforms, meaning we throw a straw on the ground, we suck stuff out. Um, a handful of the platforms uh, uh, elsewhere are um, sort of logistic support, like, refine, like, like pre-refining kind of things. And, and, and the Santa Barbara Channel here, these are all production platforms. Um, yeah, so again, so... so, so here they are. Um, we, the, the count of these things, the count of the wellheads, I'll say, is uh, there's 23, uh, not the, well, that's not, that's not right. The platforms, I'll just say 23 platforms in federal waters, four in state waters. One of these is in the process of undergoing final decommissioning. So one of these off of UCSB coal oil point, um, we've already removed the superstructure from that and it's in the process of being removed, but it's not officially done yet. Um, but this is the number we're talking about. And if you have a look at them, you can see they're different. They went in over a course of two decades. And so some are, some are larger than others. Some have, have different things, but they're all designed to be, um, work 24 hours a day, 
you know, 365 days a year, nonstop, nonstop, nonstop. So the crews, the human crews are rotated off, but the activity doesn't, uh, doesn't, is not supposed to ever cease. Again, this, we're, they are here because of this. So this is one of our um, uh, maps uh, from um, what we used to call Dogger. This is an old, this is a map from a previous report. So it's called Dogger, not CalGem, as we now refer to the agency. But the, these are all wellheads. These are all active, former, um, or, uh, or, or idled, meaning it's ready to be drilled, or it's drilled and it's ready to oil, take oil, but the valve is turned off. So when you have a look, you can see why, again, why we're the epicenter of this oil history here um, by us. And so what we're looking at, if you kind of squint here, everybody kind of squint at this, you can start to see some kind of roughly horizontal lines with those dots. Those are representing different geological formations. And so those are natural drill points where it's, it's thinner for us to put the straw into the ground to get the oil out. And that's what we're looking at. And so, that, so, it, so it's obvious, you know, all the stuff on land, hey, we're out in Kern County, we're out, we're out in, in Ventura County, we're in Santa Barbara County, we're in LA County, all this kind of stuff. And, and so it just makes sense. Like, why don't we, we should go offshore. So that's what brought people in offshore. Hey, you know, we have all this stuff here. Why don't we just get the rest of it that's out there? Um, and in places like uh, the Santa Clara Valley, this is 1920s, you also had a ton of uh, oil and gas. Okay, as we do this oil drilling, that leads to oil spills, naturally. Even, even the most well-intentioned, best designed, there's gonna be accidents, right? And so ever since we've been doing oil drilling, we've had oil spills. So, um, uh, Deepwater Horizon is our is the one that is our most famous, well-known thing so far. Everybody says that's the largest U.S. oil, it's not, the, it's not the largest oil spill in history, but people will say it's the largest U.S. oil spill. That is wrong. So when I ask you this question on the quiz next week, you should all get this correct. Is the Deepwater, was the Deepwater Horizon the largest oil spill in U.S. history? The answer is no. The Deepwater Horizon was the largest marine oil spill. So the largest spill in the, in the ocean. Yes, that's true. Not the largest overall. We'll talk about that in a second. Okay, but just to give you a sense, um, this, you know, so I did a lot of work on this. Um, a lot of people did a lot of work on this. Um, this was 4.9 million barrels, which is a strange unit. Why are, Dr. Ray, why are you using barrels? Because it's oil and that's the, way we most typically measure, sell, uh, uh, ship oil, etc. So here you go, I, ha I have a cheat sheet for you. So um, uh, 42 gas, so one barrel equals 42 US gallons. So we're just gonna say US barrel of oil. We'll just leave it at that. Um, the, the Brits have a slightly different number of gallons in their barrels, it gets confusing. But so, so one barrel is 42 gallons. So it's a lot of, it's a lot of oil, right? Think of like a, a 55 gallon drum, you know, kind of, obviously it's not quite 55 gallons, but it's that, that, that visual sort of size roughly, right? Okay, 4.9 million barrels. If we're talking gallons, that's 208.5. That comes from what's known as the flow rate technical group, which I believe is the correct number. A judge in a lawsuit a couple years later said, uh, legally, we're gonna, we think less oil flowed out. No, I follow the science, not, not the judges. So the science suggests we, we spilled um, about 4.9 million barrels of oil in that event, which lasted for over 80 days and was a continuous crazy thing. Um, do you guys remember that? You, you, guys are, you guys are the age, maybe you guys are not remember. Do you remember that on the news when it was happening? Uh, Louisiana, yeah, 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 Gulf of Mexico, yeah. I feel like we have one closer to like... That's the Refugio spill, 2015, yes. Yes. Okay, so, um, so, Deepwater Horizon, um, uh, to give you a, a scale, the largest oil spill we know of was in the wake of the first Gulf War, which you guys certainly won't remember this. So first Gulf War happens, Saddam Hussein invades Kuwait, who was the authoritarian dictator that was ruling um, Iraq. 
moves in to Kuwait, takes over their oil fields, and then, then the, the elder Bush forms a, a coalition of folks that come together, stage a big international thing, and go and oust those guys from the oil fields of Kuwait. As they're leaving in, in a, what people deemed ecocide, or a, an effort to sort of screw the planet over, and tactically to help them, as the Iraqi troops are leaving, they have, they have, they have the, fourth, the world's fourth largest tank army, so they had all these tanks out in the desert, and they were trying to get their tanks back home, back, go back to Iraq. Um, they wanted cover, and they knew the US and all our allies had you know, satellites and everything, so they started setting on fire all of these oil and gas wells to create this big, like, apocalyptic black soot cloud, horrible stuff. They also just broke some valves and just had the oil spilling across the desert and everything. And so a lot of those they set on fire to make it just logistically difficult for folks to find them and stuff. Um, it didn't really stop their immediate demise, but it just totally effed that part of the world up for um, still to this day. Because it happened during war and people were slaughtering each other, killing each other, all that kind of stuff, and because it created such extensive smoke screens, we couldn't even use the traditional satellites to take pictures of the pooling oil in the sand, et cetera, and then especially in the coastal zone. So a good chunk of this oil, most of this oil is on land, but some of it went into the ocean. So we have a, a conference uh, a couple years later, a UN conference, and out of the conference comes the best estimate, which is something like six to eight million barrels were spilled in that, in that uh, Kuwaiti uh, intentional uh, sabotage. And so in relation to the Deepwater Horizon, that was like 120, 165% of the Deepwater Horizon, right? So that's bigger than the Deepwater Horizon. Um, and, and it was mostly on the surface of the ocean. Um, the Exxon spill, which is another super, super famous, very, very important spill, 1989. Um, this happened up in Alaska. Uh, the um, the uh, uh, captain was an alcoholic, and he's like, I'm gonna think I'm gonna go drink now. So he left the bridge. Um, so this is oil from the northern slopes of Alaska, the Barrow oil fields, comes down through the Alaskan pipeline into southern Alaska, and then is put in, into a marine terminal, and the, and the tankers pick it up and then drive it down to us in California. And so they were leaving, the, leaving, they just picked up a load of oil, and they were leaving the embayment in Alaska, and the captain goes down and starts drinking. And he puts the second mate in charge, and he didn't know what he was doing, and he ran aground and tore open the side of the vessel, and it spilled all this oil. That was um, uh, also primarily on the surface, and that was about 15% of the Deepwater Horizon, so a, a, a fraction of what happened in the Deepwater Horizon. 1979, um, so maybe this, this is another one maybe that we're, we're, we're thinking about, but um, this is the Ixtoc one. This is similar to the Deepwater Horizon, except this is in Mexican waters and shallower water, but it's an offshore platform. They have a blowout. Boom, 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 boom. It goes for a while. That's about 70% uh, of the deep water horizon. And that was mostly released at depth, a relatively shallow depth, but at depth 50 meters. And then we have the thing we're talking about right now, the Santa Barbara oil spill. So this was about 2% of the deep water horizon. So a small fraction. So quantity wise, not as big a deal, but policy wise, management wise, a huge deal. We also had the Torrey Canyon, which was a, an oil tanker uh, that uh, uh, ran aground. And um, by the time we were making only one single hulled vessels. And so when this guy hit a rock, it popped everything open and it caused this huge oil spill. That was about 15% of the Deepwater Horizon. And then this is the answer. So if I ask this question, what is the largest oil spill in US history? It's the Lakeview Gusher. And probably none of you guys have heard of that. Am I correct? Right. So this is in Kern County. So, you know, we're this epicenter of oil and gas production. We're also an epicenter of oil spill history here. So this is about almost, 200, almost two times as large a release as the Deepwater Horizon. So this is what happened with, or, yeah, okay, let's skip that for now. Okay, so this is what happened. So this is the Lakeview Gusher. So this is Kern County. This is, again, early days early 1900s, we're, 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 we're like, oh, let's make some more oil, let's make some more oil. And at the time, the technology is literally tick, 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 tick into the ground. 
until you get one of, until you cut into the formation and the pressure of the oil, it's like a so it's like a can of Coke, right? So it's like I I I shake up. Imagine if I had a glass of Coke and I put a put a cellophane wrap over it, you know, a tight thing, and shook it up, and then took my straw and punctured the, that plastic lid, and then and all of a sudden, poof, you know, the Coke is just going to squirt right out the straw. That's what that's the technology, the time to get the oil out. Okay, so these guys are digging. They're digging. They're digging. And in fact, there's a historical marker here. So if you guys are bored next time you're on the five coming down the grapevine, you can drive off. Um, it's about, uh, you know, if you're on the five going north of the grapevine, it's like maybe, 15, I don't know, 15 minutes. It's near Bakersfield. It's like 15 minutes north of the grapevine. You can go off about 10 minutes and see a little historic plaque just on this random side of the road. Um, so these guys are digging, 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 and all of a sudden, boom, woohoo, hit oil. And then instead of like, woohoo, kind of spurshing up for a minute or 15 minutes or whatever, and then going out, it doesn't stop. And it starts flowing and flowing and flowing. And fl people are like, uh, when's this thing going to stop? And it just keeps going. And so what we're looking at is one of the lakes. So this looks like water. This isn't water. This is oil that's just pooling up and continuing to pool up. So um, eventually they create these 30 meter deep lakes. Multi I mean, this is crazy. And so, so and it's just going in. It's going. And so these guys are, these guys are boating on a lake of oil, right? Uh, and this is not like, you know, make a, make a concrete pool and put it, this is just in the dirt. And so the oil is like seeping into the ground, seeping in the groundwater, going everywhere. And um, they try everything. So they try, you know, damming it up. They try throwing railroad cars on it. They, uh, they, they it's cannot, they cannot deal with this, right? Yes. Try everything. They try throwing rocks on it. They try throwing big things. It just, it just keeps flowing, keeps flowing. And, and, and it's, it, it's, it's not just like burbling up from the ground. It is like jetting. It's like a geyser, like every day. I don't remember how deep they were, maybe like 100 feet or something like that. I, 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 I don't know the exact, that's a good question. I, I should know. I don't know. Um, but it went on for so long, they laid an additional railroad track out to it and it became a tourist attraction. So people in LA would take a day trip up and they would go up to see the Lakeview Gusher. And if the wind was blowing away from the train, they would lower the, the train windows down and they would look out. And if the wind was blowing toward the train, they'd keep the windows up because the whole side of the car would get dusted in oil, you know, oil grease kind of thing. So this is crazy. So the largest oil spill in U.S. history is the Lakeview Gusher, 1910. 1910. Eventually, in, in, these, in these situations, eventually the only thing that stopped it was the, the pressure equalized. So all that deep pressure and all that, the, the, the compressed gas and everything just eventually vented. And so it, it stopped flowing. Do you think that could have happened naturally? Like it exploded out? No. No, no, it was 100% human cost. I mean, like, if no human... Yeah, no, no, there's so much. I mean, I don't know. Theoretically, if, you had, if it was on a, a, an earthquake fault or something, but, but the nature of the earthquake fault would have meant that that oil would never have built up to that pressure in the first place. So, so very, very unlikely. Very unlikely. Um, okay, so that was the Lakeview Gusher. So when I ask you, what's the largest oil spill in U.S. history? The answer is... Like you gusher. What year? All right, good. So a long time ago. Okay. So um, as with many things we'll find out in coastal marine management, um, you know, sometimes like you and I are real smart and we sit down together and we go, mm, maybe we should do this. Right? And that happens. But a much more powerful thing is a crisis happens and some bad thing happens and then we go, oh my God, we never want that to happen again. So we create policy in the wake of a disaster, or in the wake of a catastrophe, or in the wake of a massive failure. Okay. Okay, so flash forward. World War II, we're a huge oil and gas producing nation. That's, what, that's key to all this kind of stuff. We finished, World War II's over, and now we're like, hey, everything is, is oil and gas powered, and now it's, we need more oil and gas. And so that, that essentially drives the oil and gas companies to start to move offshore in the Santa Barbara Channel. So we start doing that. But at the time, this technology is brand new. 
This is just like AI. This is just like social media, all these things. The government doesn't have any expertise in this. Industry is moving farther ahead with technology. They're advancing much quicker than the capacity of the government regulators to understand what's going on. So these guys start putting in these, uh, these wells. Um, so I'll, I'll explain maybe why it happened in a second, but let, let's first talk about this. So uh, there's a couple themes that will emerge with the Santa Barbara oil spill. The other reason I want you guys to know about the Santa Barbara oil spill is it governs every single person's thinking of oil spills ever since, whether they know it or not. This is a watershed event. It changed how we perceive oil spills, et cetera. Policy-wise, science-wise, uh, pop culture-wise, everything. So this is actually a, a, a U-2 spy plane picture of the oil spill that President Nixon details out here because we didn't have any ability to, to, to get the sense of the scale of what's going on, right? So this is the Cold War. Our satellites are all trained over Russia and things like that. We don't have these high resolution things, so we send the spy plane over to get this picture. What you're looking at is you're looking at the, um, the platform and this oil and gas bubbling underneath it. So it's bubbling up, that, that's, that's, what, that's what the whiteness is. So let me first say, how do we know about this problem happens? The now defunct, no longer existent, but the then Santa Barbara Independent, or not Santa Barbara Independent, uh, Santa Barbara News Press, excuse me, Santa Barbara News Press, Santa Barbara newspaper, reporters in his office, I don't remember if it was midnight or like 10 p.m., something like that, guys in the phone rings, hello? Hey, you should know what's going on in platform A. Like, the what? You should look at what's going on in platform A. Like, who is this? Who's I'm not going to tell you my name. Click. That's how the public first hears about this oil spill. A whistleblower, someone associated with the rig, felt somebody should know. Themes that start happening here. This starts happening. And it's not like, oh, some oil washed on my desk. Oil washes in covers everything. We clean it all up. And then the next day, more oil over everything. Clean that up. More oil. It was the, so, so the first theme that emerges from this, oh, okay, let me also just say real quickly, because I'm nerdy about this stuff, because I study oil spills. We just, we just use the term oil spill to apply to all this stuff. But technically, a spill is one type of an event. A blowout is another type of an event. So it's okay to just call them spills, but you should understand the difference. There's a huge management implication difference. A spill is, here's my barrel of oil, and I hand it to Angelina, and she drops it, and it cracks open. So I have a known volume of oil in here, and now, instead of being in my container, it's now on the floor. That's a spill. If a tanker runs aground, that's a spill. If a, a train shipping oil and it, goes, and it derails, that's a spill. Your car gets in an accident and the gasoline cracks, the gasoline tank cracks open and the gasoline goes in the ground, that's a spill. A blowout is different. A blowout is an unknown volume of material and it is ongoing. This is technically a blowout. So this wasn't like 100 gallons that left the container and then went to the ocean. This was like ongoing. The difference is a spill, very quickly we know what the worst possible scenario is. How big is that tanker? How big is your gasoline tank in your car? That's the worst it could possibly be, right? With a blowout, you don't know how bad it can be. And so in the case of the Deepwater Horizon, you have to deal with it for the primary spill for at least 87 days, right? And so, so it's a very different management framework if it's a blowout versus if it's a spill or, or potentially, potentially different management framework. Okay, so, so this keeps happening and there's this sense that we cannot do anything. We cannot stop it. These guys try everything on the oil rig, they cannot make it stop. So the sense that when, this, when these oil spills, especially blowouts happen, it's beyond our human control to do anything. The damage is done. So it's immense. It's uncontrollable, theme one. Theme two is that all of our technology will not work. Tremendous advancements in technology to do drilling, 
to find the oil, to extract the oil, to, ref to, to turn it into whatever product, really, really cool technology, amazing advances, almost nothing in terms of the stopping of oil spills technology advances. So when this happens in 1969, again, here's another one of those, here's another one of those uh, U-2 spy plane uh, photos. Um, this is how we're mapping it. We're flying an airplane, taking photographs, going developing the photos, coming in, and then people drawing it on a map and trying to estimate where it is and stuff. Here are these guys in the lower left in Santa Barbara Harbor trying to scoop it up, right? Good luck with that. Go hang out in the harbor and just scoop up this oil coming in at every wave, right? The general technology was to get bales of hay delivered from the ranchers, throw the hay onto the beach, the hay absorbs a little bit of the oil and then rake up the hay and go throw it in the, in the dump. That, that's the technology, right? So this theme of we, we, we do not have the right technology to respond to this crisis. Yeah. Um, I'll get to that in a second. Uh, basically, bad drilling. And then a third theme here is this idea, and this is, this is new in 1969 ecological environmental impact. That most of the impact is not to people, most of the impact is to nature. And that's viewed as a bad thing. And so, uh, so here's a, the Union Oil was the, was the then company that owned that platform. And this is the president, after a couple days, he goes down to the harbor in Santa Barbara, everybody's cleaning up. And he says, one of the classic quotes of all time in terms of environmental policy, he says, talking about the oil spill that's ongoing, I don't like to call it a disaster because there's been no loss of human life. I'm amazed at the publicity for the loss of a few birds, right? Foot into mouth, ready, go. And again, this isn't a 1969 phenomenon we first see here, but this plays out every single time. Deepwater Horizon, uh, Tony, the, the, the then head of BP, says, you know, oh, woe is me. You know, I, this, this hasn't been a party for me either, right? As his oil is destroying lives and destroying ecosystems and stuff, right? Um, so, so the first time we try to treat oiled seabirds, which is now a, a, a foundational part of a coastal oil spill. So these guys have picked up this uh, grebe and they are, um, they're essentially taking detergent and, and they're trying to wash the oil out, out of its feathers. We know at this point that most of that is all for making people feel better. That's all for humans for the most part. Um, that once these birds have been oiled, because these guys are seabirds and they need to maintain a, a, a watertight protection in the cold water, they constantly are preening, constantly cleaning their oils. They have a lot of oil glands that keep their feathers oiled. So they have a nice, essentially, coat. The oil gets on there, mats that together, and doesn't let the feathers have loft, doesn't let the feathers trap little pockets of air, and so they stop being insulated. So rather than having a coat in the water, now they're just sitting naked in the water, and they essentially die of hypothermia. So when they get oiled, the natural tendency as a bird, anytime anything gets on a bird, is they preen, they're cleaning their feathers, and that leads them to ingest a huge amount of oil, and that's usually acutely toxic to them. So, a lot of times, by the time we get these birds, if they're significantly oiled, they're, they're you know, we didn't know that at the time, but the, you might clean them up and they look good and they're okay for a day or two or three and they, they keel over and die because their organs are shutting down. And then this, I, the thing I always talk about this picture is, so I did my undergrad at UCSB. One of my majors was a program that was created because of the Santa Barbara oil spill, the environmental studies program there. Um, and this is the trifecta. So this is, so this is, the bird, wildlife's oiled, right, um, uh, and messed up. The kelp is oiled, so the ecosystem is being nuked, and this surfboard is covered in oil. So the human activities that we normally do, we weren't allowed to do. So this is sort of bad on all fronts. Um, this then very quickly ignites this massive, insane, the first really, really big public firestorm, right? We talked about the Lakeview Gusher. People were driving out, let me go see the Lakeview Gusher in the, in the train, right? Eating my coffee and my whatever that people ate 100 years ago. Now, it's completely different. Why? Because all the powerful people like Santa Barbara. 
Santa Barbara is where all the pretty people go, where all the movie stars go, where all the Hollywood media moguls go for vacation or they live. And so now this was happening to the powerful people and they were pissed. They were not happy at all. This is what happens to the poor folks. This is what happens to the third world country. This is what happens over there. This doesn't happen in my pretty high-end beach town. What the hell, right? So there was this huge, huge media firestorm. So amongst other things, you see the things like this. So the president or, or the governor, whoever at the time we're talking about, at first they don't do anything and then they're like, oh, I got to show up. So then they're going to do something. And so uh, first ignores it and then eventually has to fly to California. That's what this picture is, is here in the middle. He's walking on the beach going, oh yeah, I see his oil, right? Not going to do anything. But it's be it becomes very clear that this is such a national crisis that the leader has to come and show that he or she is doing it. Same thing with Kamala Harris when she was... Um, then um, Attorney General of California, when the 2015 oil spill happened, she just came out, walked around, didn't do anything, but walked around, had her hair blowing, couldn't, couldn't even see her face because it was all windy and she was trying to have her hair all nice. And, but it was like, you have to kind of show up, right? You got to like show that you feel the pain and everything, right? And so that starts with the Santa Barbara oil spill. Everybody goes to the spill and, and says, oh, shucks, this is so bad. Uh, this then leads to different things. And so then when it looks like... Um, uh, uh, problems are going on, then it's like, hey, maybe we should do something. And so that you start to hear these, these proclamations from our leaders. Oh, we're going to change how we do stuff. Um, what else? Uh, okay, so this is, this is um, uh, San Marcos High School, which is one of the big high schools in Santa Barbara. They were having their, the drama kids were having their, their high school play. They throw out the play and they write their own and they write a... Um, um, what, do we, what do we call it when it's the, the um, melodrama? They wrote a melodrama um, of a classic, oh my, you know, like those kind of old like black and white movie kind of stories. And so the story is of the evil oil guy dripping oil and the poor innocent little girl who just happened to be named Barbara, right, is being attacked by the bad villain, right? And this, we're, we, and we get stuck with this, this idea that the oil people are all evil and bad and nefarious and don't give a crap about anybody. And then, and then the environment and the citizens are just innocent bystanders that are being victimized by the poor, evil, oil, bad guys, right? That narrative really boils up. We also, so then th this is a, a protest where um, when Nixon was landing at the airport, a bunch of, uh, in this case, women show up and then they get naked. And so they have a, a naked protest. So we start seeing these very different types of protest movements spurs up. One of the things that it also creates is a new series of NGOs, a new series of non-governmental organizations oriented around anti-oil. You see a lot of anti-oil groups that, that, that proliferate, starting with the Santa Barbara oil spill, but with every major oil spill since. In this case, this is so-called goo or get oil out. Um, now, uh, these folks have gotten much more sophisticated, but at the time, these guys would roll up in their Lincolns, lugga, 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 you know, big eight cylinder, one person, lugga, 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 getting, I don't know, like 15 miles to the gallon, lugga, 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 get out and go protest. We don't want oil here, right? Which at the time um, looks a lot like we want all you poor folks over there to go have your, you, you make the oil for us, right? It's since evolved into into being, you know, let's get rid of oil from, as from a societal perspective. But at the time, it's just about, get away from me. We don't want this impact on me, which is a, which is a natural, um, you know, it's understandable why that, that happens. Okay, so what happened? So the question before was, what happened? So this is what actually happened with the Santa Barbara oil spill. So the primary, the primary flow was for 11 days. Um, it's almost assured that there was diffuse flow for at least a year. But again, we, people weren't out there monitoring this. We don't have rigorous data. This is one of the key themes. We don't have data. We don't have monitoring. We're trying to understand impact when we don't have any facts in front of us. Okay, so what happened? So what happened was, um, it was, okay, so at the time, the idea is, and still how we do this, we drill a hole in rock. Drill, 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 drill. So we drill a hole, 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 
And then after we made that hole, we put a casing around that hole, okay? So a sheath, a straw, metal straw, straw around, boom, 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 boom. So at the time, when the folks were, when the oil companies were drilling, at the time it was the USGS that was the federal entity that was sort of approving designs for this stuff because they studied geology. So they're like, okay, you guys be in charge of this. Um, the company said, hey, we're going to drill into rock like this deep, but it's expensive to put this metal straw. So we only want to put the straw down a certain amount of the whole rock hole. Is that okay? And the USGS people said, yeah, sure, I guess. Well, it turns out that was a key part of the problem. So, um, so the well bore, which is, which is the, the hole. Okay, so again, this is, the platform is in the air. It's on stilts. The stilts are attached to the bottom of the ocean. So, the pipe goes down through the water and then it gets to the rock and then we start drilling. So when we talk about depth, we're talking about depth into the rock, okay? So this particular drill was uh, over a thousand meters, so over a kilometer down into the rock, okay? Only seven, only the top 7% of it had a metal straw around it. So what that means is it was just naked rock. So if, if as they hoped the rock was really strong, hard rock, I'm gonna hold myself together. It turns out it wasn't. So either because it was fracturable, breakable, or because of the very act of us drilling in, kind of cracked some stuff, it weakened the rock sides of the walls. So as we started production and that oil and gas started coming up, the pressure of the oil coming eventually started, so it started going around into the rock and creating new fissures, new ways of the oil and gas getting out. So it wasn't that the oil was coming straight up with the straw and going up my nose, it was going in all the water around me, which again, contributes to this feeling of impotence. I don't know what's going on. I don't understand. Why is there oil out in the water? Like, wait, what? You know, all that stuff. So key themes here, and we'll probably pause here in a second and, and uh, call it uh, for today. Um, but, but so um, I'll just say the key themes here, media circus. So this is now, for, for the first time, a poster child of an environmental crisis. Every, it's front page news now, all over the nation. It's the leading thing on the evening news at night. Like, what's going on? Why are we still having this? Again, as he said before, it helps crystallize the modern environmental movement and leads to a lot of our uh, support for our environmental laws. It sets up this narrative that we've been burdened with ever since. And the narrative is either there's greedy oil executives versus the oiled birds versus nature, or it's the greedy oil executives versus the not in my backyard enviros that just want us to do something else elsewhere, right? All of these things are caricatures, right? All of these things simplify the real, the, the real relationships and the real things, but nevertheless, that's what we have. And you see, whenever an oil spill starts, we immediately, the very first story, that's how, the, that's, how, that's how the story is being framed. It's locked into our public consciousness, our societal consciousness as to how you think about these things. What we first document in the, this spill is increased toxicity to some things. Increased toxicity to birds, see a lot of dead birds, see a lot of dead marine mammals, sea lions and things like that and a lot of dead intertidal invertebrates. Um, hard to know what exactly, so uh, like you guys are we're doing opinion polls, we're doing seafood surveys, that kind of stuff. One of my old professors um, used to have us go survey the intertidal as part of class. And so, because they just been doing it, not for research, just say, hey you guys, we're gonna, gonna teach you guys the muscles, and let's go down here, let's do some stuff. When this started happening, they're like, oh my God, you guys, let's go. Cancel class, we're running down to the intertidal. Let's count everything. That was one of the only data points we had because it was before the oil started washing ashore up by UCSB campus. It was like we, we had some data of the number of mussels and how much algae and stuff was there before the oil came ashore. But for the vast, vast, vast majority, we did not have baseline data. We didn't know what the invertebrates were, what the, what the kelp density was, that kind of stuff. Most of what we know about in terms of environmental impact, ecological impact, comes from a study that's commissioned years later, okay? 
and this is run out of USC. And the question is, when this started happening, everybody was saying, oh my God, the fisheries are dead. Oh my God, all the sea lions are dead. The dolphins are all dead. Oh my God, everything's dead. And it was clearly, it clearly had these impacts. It killed a lot of intertidal critters and everything. But after a while, stuff came back. And so people were like, hey, how come the world didn't end? We thought the world was gonna end with this oil spill, right? And so that was the, that was the question posed to this uh, large group of scientists. And it was like, hey, what's, so it was run by USC, but it was people from all over that contributed to this. And so here are the three key takeaways that again, governs all of our thinking. It governs how we think about Deepwater Horizon, how we think about the refugio spill in 2015, everything. Okay, so here's what happens. So we have a takeaway. And these are largely speculations because we didn't have robust quant quantified data. But for the eukaryotes, for the ma you know, macroscopic critters and things like that, uh, if they were uh, bacterial type of uh, critters and, and, and algae and things like that, uh, the no notion is that they evolved to tolerate oil, critters in our part of the world, right? So they either had behavioral responses or other responses to, to deal with oil because they, they're used to growing up in an area, living in an area that had oil seeps. So, so that's what's going on. That's why not more critters were killed. If there are microbes, the argument is that, oh, these, these microbial critters have evolved with oil. They can either tolerate it or maybe they can even eat the oil. That was the idea. So in an oil-rich area, the critters are less likely to be harmed by an oil spill, is the thinking. Secondly, why wasn't it worse? Oh, because in over this 11-day primary period, we had two, this is January, remember, we had two big storms come in. And the storms choppied the water, made stuff go up and down, all that jazz, and then uh, and broke it up. That was the argument. A human perspective, a human beings that live in the air perspective. I don't see any more oil on the surface, we're good. All that oil went somewhere, but because we couldn't easily see it, we're good, right? You see that time and time again. The main way we, we respond to things like Deepwater Horizon, throw dispersants on it. So the oil goes off the surface and, and disperses into the water column. Still toxic, still toxic substance, just not on the surface. Um, and, then, and then a third part of this, which, is, which continues that even more, because a lot of this was that heavier fraction, that, that thicker tar-like stuff, oh, when it came out, it just sunk to the bottom. So we're good to go. Again, if you're a midwater column critter, if you're a crab on the bottom, you're screwed. But hey, that seems good, right? We don't care about the crabs. We don't care about the lobsters. So this... This is really how most people still think about oil spills to this day. Um, and so uh, we'll just end with a couple quick examples uh, talking about this. But so here's Ventura County, and these are our existing. Oh, okay, so anyway, quick questions. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? So, so another one that this does, as I think I have a slide in a little bit, but we'll probably end here or very quickly end here. Um, so... Uh, one, this creates our large-scale environmental tools. This helps create support for Endangered Species Act, Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, all these things. But it also leads to much, much greater scrutiny of oil and gas, particularly in California, particularly in Southern California. So, so specific oil management policies. So for example, here, is our, here are our oil fields in Ventura, right, uh, in Ventura County. And, um, and these are, and the basin is an area that, uh, you know, is a geological structure basically. And the orange color here are large concentrations of, of oil deposits, historic oil deposits. And so you can see it, firstly, it's not everywhere. It's in certain places we are, we're much more likely to have it than others. Um, and you can actually go and do this yourself. So this is public data. So you can go to, we used to be called Dogger, now called CalGym, you can go to their website and there's actually, uh, you know, web browsers now um, where you can go in and you can actually say, hey, if I look at my home, do I have any oil and gas stuff around me? 
Um, now, uh, nowadays, if, if, if Carson wants to drill an oil well and he gets a permit and he drills his oil well and he drills it, he has to say at the end of this, I will cap it. I will, when I'm done with this, I'm going to put an appropriate seal. I'm going to make sure the oil can't come back to the air once I'm done with it. But a lot of this stuff, right? All these, like all, well, I don't want to jump back too many pictures, but like those old pictures of those oil wells, ain't nobody capping that stuff, right? So we also have in our county a large number, unknown how many, because we weren't mapping the wells really well in 1905 and 1910 and 1911, right? A significant number, to be sure, are uncapped, meaning slowly leaking still, right? But, but we, don't, we don't know, and we don't know how many. But you can, get, you can start to get a sense if you look on CalGEM, the sort of uh, scale of the problem. Other things that came out of this, as I mentioned before, are, so in addition to that data, in addition to now people, now there's much more transparency with what's going on where, also, we have policies to respond to oil spills. So the, one of the first thing that comes along, um, and, and this is in response to the Torrey Canyon, which happens just two years before the deep, uh, two years before um, Santa Barbara oil spill, it's to begin to start to have some contingency planning. If we have an oil spill, what should we do? Let's have a plan on the books. Let's have people trained and ready so when bad stuff happens, we can just go and do it. We don't have to sit around for a while and decide what we should do. And this really sets up the very first uh, 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 framework for dealing with oil spills. Um, this will then evolve over the years with, with Santa Barbara oil spill, with all these other oil spills. And most importantly for us, it gets a huge shot in the arm with the Exxon Valdez oil spill in 1990. In particular, we passed what's known as the Oil Pollution Control Act of 1990, which nobody ever pronounces that, they all, they all just say the acronym OPA90. So that really creates the modern framework for that we now deal with oil spills going forward. Um, we also have CERCLA, which is the Comprehensive Environmental Response Compensation Liability Act, which uh, you might know as a Superfund, which is, which is um, also related to sort of large spills, not just of oil. Um, but, uh, but OPA 90 really um, is the framework that we've been operating with uh, since then. And um, yeah, maybe I'll just, maybe we'll just stop there. So, oh, I'll just say one more thing before we stop. Okay, so another important outgrowth is Santa Barbara. The county of Santa Barbara creates a division within their county government to specifically oversee, regulate oil and gas. Under this current framework that we have for dealing with oil spills, there is a lead agency. If the oil spill happens on land or like in mountains or whatever, it's sort of one group, if it happens somewhere else. In our case, a marine oil spill, the lead agency, anybody want to guess what the lead agency is of, of managing the spill itself? Coast Guard. So the Coast Guard is the default lead agency. And then there's all these other agencies that have something to do with this. So uh, Fish and Wildlife for the critters, uh, the EPA for you know, dealing with the compounds and measuring the, the air quality, all that kind of stuff, right? So we have those folks. We also have what's known as, after, in the language of Open 90, the responsible party. So whoever's ship it was, whoever's refinery it was, whoever's oil platform, that, that they're there, so we have this big command center, right? So the co in the case of the oil, oil, marine oil spill, Coast Guard's in charge. They're, they're the, the, the leaders. And it's a sort of paramilitary organization, right? It's all the structure and everybody's underneath everybody. And, and people are at the table. Most people that have the power are the feds and the state. And then the responsible party is there. And essentially what, the, what we do after Open 90 is we make the responsible party do all the stuff for the most part, right? If they can, if they're incapable, we do it for them. But the, but the default is you do this. We got to hire these guys to clean up the beach. Hey, you go hire the people to pay up the beach, clean up the beach, that kind of stuff, right? And so the idea is we're looking, you're doing this. We're looking over your shoulder every single thing. If you're not doing it right, we're going to step in. 
but it's your mess. You clean it up is the, is the sort of conceptual idea. You and I are not at the table. The county is not at the table. The city is not at the table. Where do people go when they're pissed off about the oil spill watch up? They go to the city, they go to the county. Like, what's, what are you doing? Like, I don't know. So the only place in, the, in, in an oil spill in California where a county is at the table making decisions is Santa Barbara County because they have this agreement. They've set up their, their, um, their uh, a response that the, the Santa Barbara County Office of Spill Response and, and oil and gas production is super powerful and very strong. And that is a direct result of this 1969 oil spill and the people were so ticked off as to what happened. Like we wanna make sure that we have a strong local representation if we have another oil spill. And you see that in subsequent spills like the Refugio spill, right? They're in the room. Whereas if that, when the, when the Hall Canyon spill, for example, happened in Ventura uh, around the same time, a couple of years before that, you know, around the same time, um, you know, like the county is like an observer. And maybe the county would come out and tell you what's going on, but it, it, it's sort of, you had to wait for the information to dribble out. So what we see in, in response to the Santa Barbara oil spill is we see um, these narratives coming out, these perspectives of how powerful or lack of power, uh, lack of power we have, assumed impacts, and, and uh, we have a, a story narrative that's applied to Instagram, to TikTok, to ABC News, to the New York Times, to just about anywhere, right? And in some cases, that's really helpful, but in other cases, that gets in the way of the actual, every spill is a little bit different. So it's a blessing and a curse, but you should, you should recognize that that, uh, as opposed to some random chemical spill accident, the public wouldn't have an immediate knee-jerk what's going, uh, knee-jerk response to what's going on. Um, you have to, it's the law. Whenever you have an oil spill, you have to show an oil bird. You must show an oil bird. Every single photographer is gonna run around and look for an oil bird. Even if there's just one or two dead oil birds, that's gonna be the picture on the front of the LA Times or whatever, right? We're, we're locked into these narratives. That's how powerful this 69 Santa Barbara oil spill was. Even though in the grand scheme of things, environmental impact wise, it was relatively minor massive in terms of our, our planning, our thinking, our conceptualization of, uh, uh, of oil management in general and oil spills in particular. And then as we deal with climate change, thinking about maybe we should start getting off of oil as well. Cool? Okay, questions about that? Okay. Um, and so, uh, so I have more to talk about this, but we can, we'll talk about it next time.